text for the message this afternoon comes, as I said a moment ago, from Paul's letter to the Colossians. Again, I invite you, if you have Bibles, to turn with me to Colossians chapter 4, and we will read together verse 5. Colossians 4, verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. This is the word of the Lord. One of the distinguishing marks of missional preaching is the avoidance of the us-them distinction. This is what the experts, the theorists say, Those who are preaching ought not to unnecessarily alienate unchurched people, and so we who preach must do our best to avoid us-them distinctions. And in terms of my own experience, this is one way in which my preaching has changed over the years. I think in times past, I unnecessarily invoked that distinction and, of course, created scenarios in which unchurched people were alienated. I'll give you an example. I used to say things like, the world in which we live is very consumeristic, but we as Christians know not to locate happiness in things. Now I'm much more inclined to say we are consumeristic people. But the gospel teaches us to locate our happiness in Christ. Do you see the difference? In the second example, I'm including the church in the problems of culture, which is, in fact, I think, a more honest way of communicating so that people don't think that the church is a gathering of super moral people, what you discover, in fact, is that we fall prey to many of the very same temptations those around us face. So we ought to be very sensitive about using the us-them distinction in our preaching and in our communication, and yet it is vitally important for us this afternoon to recognize that there is an us-them difference The Christian church, after all, I hope you will agree with me, is not open to everybody and anybody. You have to believe certain things in order to be part of the Christian church. And if you don't believe those things, you can't be part of the church. It is necessary for you to believe, for example, that Jesus is the Son of God sent by the Father to save sinners who died on the cross and rose from the dead, ascended into heaven... And if you can't adhere to these important things about Jesus, well, then you can't be a member of the Christian church. And in saying that, I hope you recognize with me that what is true of the church is in fact true of any community. Any and every community has boundaries somewhere. You can't be on the Greenpeace board, for example, if you're a climate change denier. You can't be part of the gay-straight alliance if you hate gays. And you can't be part of the Christian church if you don't believe certain things and endeavor to live in a certain way, which is to say that a fully inclusive community is a myth. A community, in order to be a community, must have boundaries. A community, in order to be a community, must exclude some. This is, of course, what the Apostle Paul recognizes in our text because he uses this term, outsiders. A little jarring at first when you encounter it. If there are outsiders, presumably there are also insiders. And so, in the time that we have together this afternoon, we want to explore these two terms. First of all, identifying outsiders and insiders, and then looking at the relationship between insiders and outsiders. First of all, the identification, 
of outsiders and insiders, and then the relationship between insiders and outsiders. So first of all, then the identity. The Apostle Paul says, verse 5, walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Who are the outsiders? Now, of course, because we live in a society that privileges, values, valorizes the notion of inclusion, the term, the very term outsider seems offensive, maybe harsh at first glance. And if you do some reading about New Testament times, you will discover that the Jews at the time of the New Testament sometimes use this word outsider to describe others in a derogatory fashion. And it simply is a fact that Jews in Bible times sometimes spoke of non-Jews or Gentiles in demeaning ways. Uh, Gentiles were sometimes denominated dogs by the Jews in Jesus' day. Even today, sometimes you will hear Jews uh, speak of goyim, uh, the Hebrew word for nations, in a way that is derogatory. It certainly isn't true of most Jews, but on occasion you hear that term used in a demeaning way to describe non-Jews. But there's nothing derogatory about the term outsider here. Who, who are the outsiders? Well, I think we're helped here by envisioning scenarios from the Bible where you have insiders and outsiders. So one such scenario might be the ark. Some of you here, those of you who've grown up in the church at least, would, would know, I would think, the story of the flood, Noah and the ark. And inside the ark, of course, you have people who are safe and dry and fed and warm. And outside the ark, you have people whose lives are threatened. No matter how high you try to climb up the hills, your life is in danger. And so inside the ark means life and safety, and outside the ark means danger and eventual death. You could also think to invoke another biblical image of the city of refuge in the Old Testament. You discover in the Law of Moses the prescription for cities of refuge to protect those who were innocent of wrongdoing, to protect the innocent of unjust punishments. Now, on my sabbatical, I spent a month in Brazil, and I discovered that in Brazil you have a lot of vigilante justice. And so if your neighbor thinks that you killed his dog, your neighbor might kill your dog, and everyone will accept it. That's accepted retaliation. But what if you didn't kill your neighbor's dog? What protection do you have from vigilante justice? Well, in the Old Testament, if, if uh, someone was killed, then the victim's family was required or entitled at least to punish the offender. And so if you were accused of killing someone, the victim's family would appoint an individual, an avenger, to exact justice on you, but what if you killed someone inadvertently, unintentionally? Or what if you didn't kill someone at all, but simply were thought to have killed someone? Then you could run to a city of refuge and you could enjoy protection. So inside the city there is protection and life, and outside the city there is danger and potential death. You could think of a sheep pen. Uh, the imagery that Jesus uh, would sometimes appeal to in the Gospels. Now, of course, uh, in the time of, of the Bible, shepherds would take their sheep out to the pastures during the day, and often by night, they would bring the sheep into a sheep pen, a walled enclosure that would often have thorns or thistles on the top of the wall to keep predators and intruders out. Sometimes there would be a little gateway into the sheep pen and the shepherd would sometimes lie across that gateway. But inside the sheep pen, again, there is protection. Outside the sheep pen, there is danger. That's where you're up against the predator and the intruder. Am I using too many analogies? How about one more? This one's a little different. Imagine a banquet. Imagine a banquet hall, you have chandeliers, you have a big table, plenty of food and wine, there's festivity around the table, there's celebration, singing, dancing inside. 
the banquet hall, there's light and festivity and food. Outside the banquet hall, there's darkness and melancholy. So, if you were outside the ark, you were threatened by floodwaters. If you were outside the city of refuge, you were threatened by the avenger. If you were outside the sheep pen, you were threatened by a predator or an intruder. And if you were outside the banquet hall, you were deprived of food and festivity. So in each of these scenarios, outsider is not a demeaning term, a derogatory term. It's a term used by those on the inside of those who are on the outside and who are in peril, who are in danger. There's the hint, I think, of concern for those who are outside. Well, if those are the outsiders, then who are the insiders? Well, if you're inside the ark, you're safe from the floodwaters. If you're inside the city of refuge, you're safe from the avenger. If you're inside the sheep pen, you're safe from the predator. If you're inside the banquet hall, you're not deprived of food and festivity and life. If you're on the inside, you're in a realm of life and liberty and provision and joy and safety. I want to ask you this question, where in the world can you find a place, a realm where there is life and liberty and safety and security and food and provision and joy and happiness? Well, that place is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church, you see, is intended at least to be a kind of refuge for people in the world. And when I spent some time in Europe, I walked through very old cathedrals that have very, very thick walls. Sometimes uh, you may have seen these cathedrals yourselves. It seems excessively thick. I don't know how thick these walls were, more than a meter in some instances. And I discovered that the thickness of the walls of cathedrals was not simply architectural in order to hold up the roof, but that the thickness of the walls was in some cases theological, and that it, these thick walls were designed to communicate something to the world about the nature of the church as a place of refuge, where people can be safe and warm and fed and happy. Now, of course, we're not just referring to buildings, are we, when we talk about the church? In fact, that's not the primary referent at all. But the Bible does speak about the church as the house of God, as the body of Christ, as the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is the place where the good news of salvation in Christ is preached. It is where the sacraments are administered, where church discipline is exercised. It is where the Lord Jesus Christ works especially, bringing all of his gifts to bear upon the lives of people. It is where Jesus forgives people, where Jesus renews people, where Jesus is operative in the lives of people. It is a realm of grace and sanctification, faith, love, and hope. But I think we need to recognize this afternoon that when we speak of insiders, we're not simply speaking of those who are in the church or even just members of the church. We're speaking especially of those who are in Christ. And if you read through the New Testament, you discover this is the Apostle Paul's favorite way of describing Christians. They are those in Christ. And it's a sad fact that we have to admit that not all those who are in the church are in Christ. It's a sad reality that is important for us to acknowledge that not everyone in the church is in Christ. Christ is the ultimate place of refuge. Christ is the ark, ultimately, in which we find refuge, the city of refuge in which we are safe, but perhaps you know what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name, cast out demons. In your name, perform many miracles. And Jesus will say, away from me. I never 
knew you. Well, these then are the identities of outsiders and insiders. How are insiders to relate to outsiders? Well, that's what Paul says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. I think there are at least four ways in which we can understand this injunction, this exhortation of the Apostle Paul. And the four ways are, one, we should exercise caution. Two, we should lament the situation. Three, we should remove obstacles. And four, we should seize opportunities. Four ways to honor and obey this verse. To exercise caution, to lament the situation, grieve the situation, to um, remove obstacles, and then fourthly, to seize opportunities. First, exercise caution. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Be cautious around outsiders. What I discovered from my research is that this interpretation is the preferred interpretation of older Bible interpreters. It's the interpretation you find in John Calvin. It's the interpretation you find in Matthew Henry. And it may be because of their particular context that they had this interpretation. Uh, John Calvin envisions the church as a city where all the residents are believers and those outsiders are strangers to the city. And he says we must be cautious about the strangers to the city, lest we are defiled, he says, by their pollutions. Matthew Henry writes, Be careful in all your conversing with them not to contract any of their customs, for evil communications corrupt good manners. Be very cautious around outsiders, lest you are defiled by their pollutions, lest you contract some of their customs. But I have to say to you this afternoon, I don't think it's simply because of the cultural context in which John Calvin and Matthew Henry lived. I think there is biblical warrant for this interpretation, in part because of what we read in the parallel passage in Ephesians 5, which we read a moment ago. Listen to this. There the Apostle Paul says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Well, the days are evil. And I think, uh, to be very honest with you, this is something I didn't fully understand uh, earlier in my ministry at Blessings where I, I really recommended an approach to missions that, that is called incarnational. And uh, I thought it was very important for people in the church to be very involved in society, involved in the neighborhood, serving alongside of others here and there and everywhere. And I, I've learned that that can be problematic. Because what I discovered was, in some instances, the world was colonizing the church. And it wasn't the instance of the church colonizing the world, but members of blessings who perhaps were not as deeply rooted in the Christian faith as they ought to be were susceptible, in some cases, to influence from societies in ways that were negative. So I think the advice that is given by the likes of Calvin and Henry is wise, be cautious. In fact, Jesus himself makes this point, doesn't he, in the Gospels when he says, I send you as sheep among wolves, be as innocent as doves and as shrewd as serpents. Be circumspect, be cautious. Secondly, lament the situation. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders. Recognize that the fact that there are outsiders is a lament, is is, a, is a, a situation for which we should lament. It is a grievous situation. There are some who are outside of the church, and more pointedly, there are some who are outside Christ without hope in the world. The fact that there are outsiders means that there are people whose lives are in peril eternally. And it's precisely this kind of uh, lament 
that you find in the ministry of Jesus himself. If you think, for example, of Matthew 23, Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, and he says at one point, it's uh, you know, good ways down the chapter, how I wished I could have gathered your children the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Jesus is grieving the situation that there were children in Israel who refused to be gathered together under his ministry the way that a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. They proved obstinate, and Jesus weeps for Jerusalem. I think you see this in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Acts 17, you know, he goes to the Areopagus in in, uh, Athens in Acts 17, and the text says there that he is greatly distressed, emotionally disturbed to see the city full of idols. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders means exercise caution. Grieve the situation. Thirdly, remove obstacles. What you discover when you engage unchurched people are the obstacles to people believing in Christ, submitting to the claims of Christ, recognizing Jesus for who he really is, and what are the obstacles? Well, what I'm discovering is that the obstacles often have little to do with Jesus and almost everything to do with Christians. And too many Christians have a reputation for being proud and judgmental. Too many Christians have a reputation for being the moral police of society while being kind of careless about their own lives. The greatest obstacle, I think, to the mission of the gospel in the Church of Canada is the profanity of believers themselves. And I'm not referring simply to profane speech, but to profane lives. We ourselves are the greatest obstacle because we profess to be Christians, but we don't always live as Christians. And so it's tough to communicate the truth of the gospel if the gospel hasn't fully been embraced by those who are in the church to start. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, exercise caution, lest you be defiled or negatively influenced grieve the situation, lament that there are those on the outside who should be on the inside and aren't. Remove obstacles. Endeavor as best you can to eliminate hypocrisy from your lives and have it replaced with sincerity and humility and devotion and love for God and for others. Fourthly, and probably most importantly, seize opportunities. Interesting Language that the Apostle Paul uses here, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. You know, in the Greek language that lies beneath our English translation, you have the the terminology of purchasing the time or buying up the time. And in the Greek uh, of the New Testament, there are two words for time, chronos and kairos, and chronos is chronological time. If you think of the progression of time in terms of hours and days and months and years, and then there's another term, kairos, which refers to opportune time, time to do something, like harvest time. And the word that's used here is not chronos, but kairos, which is to say that this is a special season that ought to be purchased, bought up, and not wasted. Well... What is this special season? What is the moment? Well, it's the season of Christ. And the season of Christ spans his, the time from his ascension to his return. It's really the last phase of history before the end when Jesus returns. It's a special time. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans 13. Listen, and do this understanding the present time, kairos, The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. This is a special season in world history, the time of Christ, and it is the season for missions. Which is why Jesus, after he died and rose, 
And before he ascended, said to his disciples, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's a special time and the Apostle Paul here speaks with a sense of urgency. I think you've got to buy up this time. You've got to redeem this time. You've got to purchase the time before the time is lost, before it slips away. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders means exercise, caution, grieve the situation, remove obstacles, and then lastly, and most importantly, I think seize the opportunities, which means that we need to begin, as Paul says earlier in Colossians 4, with praying for opportunities. Do you know what happens to me in my own life when I pray for opportunities? I get opportunities. I'm always hesitant, in fact, to pray for opportunities because I know that I'll be presented with opportunities and that I'll have to make the most of them. But to be honest, I think I'm always presented with opportunities, but when I pray for opportunities, I see them. That's really the difference. And if you're praying for opportunities to share the hope of the gospel, you will find them. And when you find them, take advantage of them to speak into the lives of people. So a community, in order to be a community, must be exclusive. There is no community in the world without boundaries. There is no community in the world that doesn't exclude some. The church is no different. But the church is open to all, isn't it? We welcome anybody and everybody. It really doesn't matter what your past is. I met with a young woman some years ago who felt she couldn't go to church, didn't belong in church, and I probed her a little bit, and then finally in tears, she admitted to me that she had had five abortions. There's a place in the church, isn't there, for people who've had five abortions. The church is, is, is open, is welcome. It doesn't matter what you've done, how long ago, how recently, it doesn't matter how serious the sin was. The church really is and ought to be a place for anyone and everyone. We really do mean it when we say, come as you are. But it's also the case, isn't it, that when you come to the church, you cannot stay as you are. It's true for those who are unchurched, but it's true for you and me as as well. Come as you are, but you can't stay as you are because the gospel confronts every single one of us. And just a couple of weeks ago, I had uh, a person in the neighborhood uh, email me, and she said, look, uh, I just moved here from uh, uh, Kitchener, I think it was, and I'm here with my um, girlfriend, and she was a girl, and she said, is your church a safe place for people in gay relationships? And I said to her, well, it's a place for everyone to come, and it's a place where everyone is going to be challenged. It doesn't matter whether you're straight or gay, the gospel is going to challenge you somewhere. And we're not about accommodating people's preferences, whether gay or straight, right? Jesus invites us all to deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow him. And that's going to be painful for all of us, for some more than others. It's going to be painful in different ways. But the gospel challenges each and every one of us, even the most seasoned Christian believer. But to be a member of the church, you have to believe in Jesus and you have to surrender to him as well. How do we relate to outsiders? Isn't it interesting that the Apostle Paul has this extraordinary sensitivity towards outsiders? You find it even in the qualifications for office. Those who are, lead, who are to lead the church must have a good reputation, 1 Timothy 3, with outsiders. Maybe that should be a question we ask prospective leaders in the church. What is your reputation like with outsiders? Can we speak to your coworkers, your neighbors, those outsiders who know you? What is their assessment of you? That would be an interesting exercise. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, mind your own business, work hard so that you might win the respect of outsiders. Always, it seems, the Apostle Paul has an eye on outsiders. And we must have that same 
sensitivity, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time, exercise caution, tread carefully, lament the situation, acknowledge how displeasing this is to the Lord and how how disastrous it could be for people to persist on the outside. Remove obstacles, examine yourself. Ask yourself the question, in what ways am I an obstacle to the gospel? And then lastly, seize opportunities to present the gospel and to promote the gospel. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we thank you for this message and for the instruction it brings. And we sense in hearing it something of the disposition of our Lord and Savior who had such a heart for the last and the least and the lost and the languishing, for those on the margins, for those beyond the boundaries, always reaching out, always inviting in, always confronting, always making demands, but doing so in a way that is gracious and loving. We pray this afternoon that we in our own lives might replicate the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, that something of the character of Jesus might shine through in our interactions with people. We pray that we might represent the Lord Jesus well. And as we think about his ministry, we are especially grateful for his death on the cross and for the sacrifice that he offered, for the atonement he made for all of our sins and shortcomings in this area. But we pray that in this new week, as we begin it, we may seize opportunities.